Dozens of antibody tests for COVID-19 have hit the market over the last month. And this wave has been met with both optimism and confusion. So let's get into what these tests are and how they might or might not be useful. By now, there are a lot of different tests. And there's variation among them, but they're all testing for the presence of two types of antibodies in blood. IgM or IgG or both. Although timelines vary and people respond differently to infection, tests might detect these antibodies by two or three weeks after symptom onset. So these tests are generally not meant to diagnose active infections, but they might be able to tell you if you had a prior infection. So let's say you take one of these tests and it comes back positive. Does that mean you're now immune? At the individual level, we all want the antibody measurement to be meaningful. You know, each of us wants to know, did I already have this infection? Do I have to worry about it? And there's a couple problems with that. One big problem is that a lot of these tests haven't been validated yet. A key issue is that we don't know what their actual sensitivity and specificity are, or in other words, how likely are false negatives and false positives. And even a highly accurate test can turn up a false positive. You know, when a condition is rare, if the prevalence of infection for people like me is really low, then a positive might be more likely to be a false positive than a true positive. The other big problem is that even if you get a true positive result, meaning you did have a prior infection, you can't be absolutely certain that you're not going to get reinfected with COVID-19. While most scientists agree that you'll have some immunity, they're not sure how effective it will be or how long it will last. These uncertainties mean that for now, relying on an antibody test to tell you if you can skip wearing a mask is not advisable. But some of these risks that are associated with making individual level clinical decisions based on antibody tests are not as pertinent to population level serology. And it's at that population level that antibody tests are more likely to play a big role over the coming months. Well-designed seroSurveys can estimate how many people have been infected. That's something called seroprevalence. And seroprevalence is really important to quantify when talking about relaxing stay-at-home orders. This is also where the concept of herd immunity comes in. So let's, let's hope and pretend right now that um, we believe that if you have antibody, that that'll bridge you to the vaccine that we all hope will be here in a year and a half. Then the question is, how much of the population do we really need to be have been infected before we start feeling like we can stand behind a little bit of herd immunity? The answer to that question relates to an epidemiologic term called r not. If you took an infected person and put them in a completely susceptible population, how many additional people would get infected? That's the r not. So the projections or the thought about the r not for, um, for SARS-CoV-2 is that it's somewhere around two to three. I have seen estimates more recently that it could be as high as five or six, but let's pretend right now it's two or three. Um, you can calculate your herd immunity by having an r not. The calculation is one minus one over the r not, and it tells you how many people need to be immune to keep the epidemic in a steady state. Let's break this down. If the r not for SARS-CoV-2 is 2, that means the seroprevalence needs to be 50% to prevent a rise or spikes in infections. If the r not is 3, then the seroprevalence needs to be 67%. And if the r not is closer to 5 or 6, you're really looking at a percentage in the 80s. A quick caveat. The calculation and thresholds I described are nowhere near foolproof but they do help us get a sense of the extent to which we can rely on herd immunity to curb COVID-19. And looking at some of the first zero surveys with published results, we are nowhere near 50 or 60% seroprevalence. In the New York State sample, which included New York City, they found about 15% uh, higher in, in New York City, but um, in Santa Clara County, it was just a couple percent. And that is information that to an epidemiologist or a policy person suggests we are vulnerable to a lot more infections because the virus is still out there and most people haven't gotten infected yet. So mask wearing and social distancing are probably not going anywhere anytime soon. Multiple sero surveys are already underway and many more are gearing up. 
Scientists are deploying different sampling methods like neighborhood door knocking or testing donated blood. An unbiased zero survey would test a random and representative sample of a population, which is hard to do. But if done well, these zero surveys could help us answer key questions about COVID-19, like to what extent have cases been undercounted or how have different demographic groups been affected? So antibody tests are going to stay in the limelight over the next year and fingers crossed, they will help us make evidence-based decisions. For more information on antibody testing for COVID-19, read the JAMA Medical News article. The link is in the description. And we've got a lot of informative content on COVID-19, so subscribe to this channel to stay up to date.